Oh, gee. John's a friend of mine, and I have a very high regard for him. And uh, I think some of the things he's doing are, are very good, and others are less effective than I wish they were. One of the things he's doing that I think is wise is that they are ordering their priorities, and they are using, essentially, the same kind of formula that I do to order mine. That is to say, I, I want to devote such limited energy as I've got to expend on this earth to those kinds of change that are going to bring the most long-lasting change. You know, what are the real fundamental things in our society? I think communications is one. I think education uh, is another. I think making the political system viable and less dominated by large corporate power is a third. In other words, I want to create the kind of country where the country can take care of itself. Like I'm, what I'm trying to do at the FCC. So the day I do leave the FCC, whenever that is, Everything just goes on like it did before, and there's still citizens groups contesting license renewals, and there are people challenging ATT rates. And somebody says, uh, hey, uh, where we at Nick Johnson? I say, I don't know. He, I guess he's off. That's what I'm trying to do, and that's what I'd like to do with the whole society, see. So John Gardner has that kind of, I mean, he's not taking up just every issue that comes along. They have thousands of issues. There ain't issued enough, I mean, there are 10 issues for each of you out there. Keep you busy more than full-time working on question is, what, you know, which ones are you going to select and really devote some energy to? So one he's picked, for example, is the seniority system in Congress. It's not a very sexy issue for most people, but by golly, it's pretty important if you want to make the, make the political system work. Campaign reform is another kind of basic thing that he's into. Uh, and they've had some effect on those. But it's, uh, they haven't really yet turned on the energy that's out there in the way that I've tried to describe to you and how you live your life. And that aspect of this whole thing, every one of you is a nader every hour of every day. The only question is, how are you voting? How are you investing that energy? You know, John Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And a lot of folks stood up and said, what can I do for my country? And they're still standing there. And nobody ever really told them. And I don't think that Gardner's organization has done as much as it might in that direction, except to tell them, you know, send us your money. And that's not bad. You know, it's better than the other things you've spent your money on. Uh, but I think there's, there's more that you can do, and that's why I admire what Ralph Nader is doing out here, uh, trying to encourage you to get this iceberg thing going. Uh, now that's something, you can't deal with the problems in Washington. That's why he and I have come to that realization. You've got to get it back out into cities and states. You've got to get it back into the lives of individual citizens. And until it's there, it just isn't going to work. I mean, this is a do-it-yourself country, and it always has been. There's just no way that you can elect a representative to Congress. I don't care who you vote for or at the Senate, or the legislature. You say, well, I'm going to take care of all this, and then you can forget it and, and uh, you know, go off and listen to music or play Pinochle or whatever, depending on how old you are. Uh, you know, you got to be at it yourself all the time. Yes? That's one of the major questions I've got to address. Now, we've been kidding a little bit around the FCC about how Dean Birch is out heading up my finance committee. Uh, a lot of broadcaster interest in getting me off the FCC. Uh, the question is, how much is that worth? You know, I, I don't know as uh, I don't know as I want him. Uh, Dean Birch is my campaign chairman. You know, last campaign he ran was for Barry Goldwater, and uh, <coughs> that one wasn't too successful. Uh, but that's one of the very real questions I've got to address here in Iowa. Uh, I don't have an organization here. Uh, I mean, to the extent that the organizations that do exist around the state and various counties here. Uh, willing to, uh, uh, would be willing to work for my candidacy if I were fortunate enough, uh, uh, is a question. I think there's a tremendous amount of support out there, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. But uh, basically, uh, I would be as dependent as anybody else, perhaps more so, on the willingness of the, of the media to let me tell a story. And if they decide to throw that switch, they decide to wipe the tape like Merv Griffin did, you know, I'm just plowing a little furrow across the state, and I might as well just pack my little tent and go home. And that's one of the things I had to evaluate today. Uh, have had since I've been here. What is the mood of the broadcasters? Uh, I don't think they're, uh, I don't think they're very anxious to have me on the FCC, but I don't think they're very anxious to have me in the United States Senate either. That's one of the questions I've got to address. Because the most valuable thing to me is my freedom. That's the thing I put above everything else. And uh, 
I, I just, you know, that, that troubles I, I think probably the question you've just put is a question on which uh, my decision is ultimately going to turn. I've taken more and more interest in my soul recently than I used to. And uh, golly, you know, that takes an awful lot of time. I mean, if you're going to really have any sort of spirit and soul to, you got to think about it. You've got to relax and you've got to wait for a little poetry to kind of come into your head and stuff. And, and it's, I found it's awful hard to do that in the back seat of a car bouncing around up here from Des Moines this evening. Uh, and you got to, I mean, if you're going to represent all these people, you got to represent all these people. You know, they're, they're not electing an individualist, they're electing a representative, senator. Uh, certainly you've sold something any time you've raised a million dollars. What is that? That's about $5,000 a pound for Jack Miller. I'm, I'm not sure he's worth that. <laughs> if we get anywhere close to that for uh, beef, you know, we'd do problems the state to be over with. We pay as much for cows as we pay for senators. Well, I don't know. That's a, that's a big question. Yeah. Well, oh, sure. I mean, forgive me for being quite so cavalier with my answer, but I mean, uh, uh, there's just been instance after instance after instance to the point now where I, I think that that's, that's probably pretty clear. Uh, program called Who Invited Us? <clears throat> was a documentary about uh, the fact that most, that the only consistent theme that runs through American foreign policy is the use of American give, uh, governmental military power to support corporate investments in foreign countries. I mean, if you're looking for a consistent theme, that's the only consistency you can find in the policy. But why else, you know, we support some communist countries and not other communist countries. I mean, what is it? We're not fighting communism. You know, that's where we're doing our television special. <laughs> um, Tune in tonight. Um, so uh, uh, that was one. Uh, another was banks in the, and, and that wasn't shown in Washington, D.C. Banks in the poor, the station showed to the banks first to see if they'd like to have it shown. A lot of them, needless to say, didn't want to have it shown. Ralph Nader did uh, some stuff on a Boston on Mobile Oil's uh, commercials. Uh, the week following, Mobile Oil, uh, out of the goodness of its heart, to found a million dollars to contribute to the Public Broadcasting Corporation. And that little segment of Ralph Nader's never appeared, or at least was certainly postponed for a long time. I don't know how what the, uh, was the ultimate outcome, but it wasn't shown when it was supposed to have been shown. Uh, Great American Dream Machine, and that little piece on, uh, on uh, J. Edgar Hoover's uh, little operation. And uh, they got a phone call or a letter or something, and that was cut out. Uh, sure, it's a problem. And ultimately the test is, you know, what do you do when you're under pressure? That's a test. I remember a session uh, after a program on the BBC when I was over there, uh, when Harold Wilson was still Prime Minister. And uh, he just uh, really gone through an incredible grilling by the guy who was asking questions. And we were having a little bite to eat afterwards. And I said, you know, how do you feel about that? You know, and uh, uh, America Agnews now is going after the networks for saying some very bland things about the president after the I said, well, you know, I expect that over here. That's what the media's supposed to do. It's supposed to attack me. I don't like it, but, you know, that's their job. And I said, well, you know, I just read in your, in your, uh, uh, this is sort of the, the constitution of BBC. I said, it gives you the power to censor their program. Well, actually, he hadn't known about that, and the director general of the BBC was there at the time, Charles Curran, and he never has forgiven me for bringing it up to the prime minister. But I said, how come you'd, uh, he said, well, I, I didn't know about that. I said, well, now you know about it. I said, would you ever censor a program? And he said, no. I said, why not? He said, well, I'll tell you why not. I said, the first time I tried to censor a program, you know what Charles would do? He said he'd go on the air, and he'd stand there before the camera, and he'd say, the program we'd originally scheduled to show you at this time will not be seen because the prime minister had censored it. And he said, the next day there'd be a by-election call, and I'd be out of office, see? <laughs> yeah, that's what this really comes down to, is what does John Macy do when he gets a call from J. Edgar Hoover? That's, you know, ultimately you put all those things together, as we say in law, in the common law process, case study process, one case after another, and that's the law of the independence of the, of the uh, Public Broadcasting Corporation. Yes? I noticed in the program about three years ago, show some of the interviewing how there was the show. The show was pretty much obsolete by the time it was out. I mean, those things had been written about long before. Fulbright had come out with a book called The Pentagon Prop. Oh, excuse me. The question was, uh, 
uh, how valid was the theme of the uh, selling of the Pentagon uh, television program. And I, I said, it seemed to me it was pretty old hat by the time it came out. The Fulbright had earlier published a book called The Pentagon Propaganda Machine, uh, in which he do uh, documented the propaganda efforts uh, of the Pentagon. Uh, and there was some squabble about the way the show was edited, but I don't think there can be any basic disagreement about the, uh, the basic, basic thrust of the show. I think, you see, that ought to be one of the major issues in the campaign this year. It's what I have called, in a, a speech I gave in London before an international association of political consultants, I called government by television. And incidentally, this convention is kind of a scary thing. Here, in a room about the size of the stage, were gathered all the guys in the world who do media for political candidates in all the different countries. I mean, it's bad enough to know they exist, but to know they get together is worse. And they go into each other's country, you know, no telling who's electing Nixon this fall, you know, or who's working for, uh, for uh, uh, McGovern or Muskie or anybody else. Because uh, they all trade around. They say, well, I'll take Brazil this year. <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, no, it's a, uh, but you watch. See, I think that ought to be an issue. Take the whole 180 degree sweep of what this administration is doing to control uh, the media. I mean, think about it. Again, it's the upfront administration. I mean, there's nothing secret about this uh, industry meeting on cable television over in the White House after it was done. You know, I say, yeah, sure. We sat down big business and worked out the policy. Same way on the media. Nothing uh, secret about the fact Herb Klein exists. Set him up, gave him a title, director of communications. You know that's the only director of communications in the world outside of the communist and fascist countries? But there he is. We give him a title, the whole works. What's his job? His job is to call up the media and praise them when they do a good job and criticize them when they do a bad job. Uh, uh, get them uh, press releases from the Republican National Committee distributed through Herb Klein's office, uh, set up appearances on talk shows and from professional football teams' locker rooms on the part of administration officials, uh, <laughs> get Martha Mitchell on the laugh-in show, stuff like that. That's what he does. Nothing secret about it. And of course, every president has tried to uh, have his influence on the media. Nothing partisan about this trait. It's just that the, it's been gradually building up over the years to the point where now President Nixon has more television advisors than people used to have in the press office and speech writers and everything all together in the White House. I mean, he's got advisors on lighting and advisors on makeup and advisors on how you stand and advisors on how gesture and the whole thing. <laughs> And I think that should be made perfectly clear. <laughs> and we ought to talk about it this year. Uh, I think it will be an issue, but I think we ought to talk about it more. Look at what they're doing now over in China. He goes over, he says, well, I want to tell you before I'm going that I'm not going to accomplish anything, but it is going to be a great television show. <laughs> and um, the guy comes on, you know, and don't miss tonight's special, The President in uh, China. And uh, later this season, we expect to have another spectacular when the president goes to Moscow. You know, don't miss your president from the White House. And they sit down and they plan the whole 72 television schedule. That's what the campaign is this year. They said, oh, we've got a show. It's going to be on Broadway in about three weeks. Called the Selling of the, of the President. They've taken Joe McGinnis's book and turned it into a Broadway play. <laughs> and it's, it's opened in uh, uh, Philadelphia. And I've just, I've read the script, but I haven't yet seen it. I'm supposed to go up to Philadelphia when I get back, if I ever get back. Um, and that, that really, that show puts it in perspective about as well as anything I can imagine. Because it's all done inside a television studio. The whole campaign is done inside this television studio, and they work out all these spots and the jingles and everything right there before your eyes. And what happens to you? Because I saw, uh, at least I saw the guys who wrote it sing the songs once at a Bathurst thing in Manhattan one evening trying to raise some money for that. The guy raised money for everything. Uh, what happens to you is that you gradually come to like the candidate. You, as you're sitting in the audience watching the show, you say, well, he's not such a bad guy after all. And then you realize what's happened to you. And you say, oh, wow. It really wasn't just funny, was it? That's what happens when people walk out. That's what it's supposed to do to you, unless you never catch on. And whether you ever catch on or not, it's what the presidential race this year is going to turn on. 
and whether we can ever talk about that issue on television, which, from the sound of this camera tonight, we haven't. <laughs> Yes. What the judge is supposed to be asking us to do on the notice that was approved. Yeah, I mean, I like I say, I know the guys, I know the candidates, I know the people who are working for them. Uh, all the candidates, all the media people, and basically they're pretty good guys. <laughs> and uh, I've asked a lot. Of them. I say, you know, what's the morality in this business? You know, I mean, how, you know, how do you decide what you're doing? He said, look, there is no morality in the business. Use whatever techniques are available to you. You poll, you computer program, you feed back to the people what they fed to you, you do the, you do the whole thing. The only morality is which candidate you pick to do it for. And we pick good guys. And basically, th these guys do. But wow, that's a little spooky, you know. I'm not sure I want those little guys in that room in London making all those decisions for me. You know, it's bad enough, you know, that they're working for Nixon, but you know, and you know they're also working for Heath. <laughs> uh, you begin to realize what the international monetary crisis is all about where it all began. <laughs> yes. No. I, I, I know Charlie. We, we both clerked for Justice Black, and I've talked with him about this quite a bit. Uh, I gave a speech at Yale called The Careening of America. Um, <laughs> oh, which incidentally, uh, it will be coming out in a, in a book uh, this spring. Uh, if I declare for office, I will cancel the publication of the book, which is one example of the curtailment of your freedom. Um, no, I won't. I'll probably let it come out anyway. Um, but no, I disagree with, uh, with Charlie's uh, view that this whole thing happens automatically. I do think it happens. Uh, and it's what I was talking to you about earlier this evening in terms of you do it. You know, there are a lot of ways of making the, uh, uh, the uh, clothing business come to an end. You know, you can bomb clothing stores, or you can pass antitrust legislation, and so another way is just to buy Levi's, <laughs> and that's what you've been doing. And the men's clothing business is going out of business. Mason Williams once told me after a concert in Detroit, all his clothes were stolen. He decided right then and there, from then on, he was going to buy clothes nobody would want to steal. <laughs> um, I think you can have an effect uh, by what you do. Uh, from day to day and hour to hour, no question about it. But I don't think that alone is enough because that fella I met working for Northwestern Bell is going to be sitting there again tomorrow. That's the problem. Yes, Ginsburg. I'm a little mystified by your uh, statement that you're going to look for some evidence of genuine enthusiasm for your candidacy while you're back here in the state. First of all, what constitutes for you genuine enthusiasm? And second, have you noticed any of it yet? Uh, to take your second question first, uh, uh, yes, I think I have. Uh, genuine enthusiasm takes the form of um, uh, a number of things. One, uh, what people say to you when you, when you meet them, folks who you haven't met for, before. I, I will say that uh, my family and personal friends have been very enthusiastic from the beginning. Uh, but uh, as numerous as they are, I don't think they're enough to uh, beat Jack Miller. Uh, so it's relevant to me to know uh, not just the, the kind of what they call in the election biz the, the recognition factor, you know, how many people have ever heard of Nick Johnson in Iowa. Uh, and I'm surprised, frankly, at how many people have heard of Nick Johnson. What's more relevant to me is, you know, how do they respond? I mean, you know, what do they think about the whole idea? Is it, well, kind of ho-hum, okay, if you'd like to go ahead and do it? Or are they really excited about the idea? You see, the thing that's much more relevant, it's much more relevant to me than the number of votes that, that Jack Miller has gotten in the past, is how much enthusiasm in this state is there for Jack Miller. It's like people voting for television programs at night when they watch them. You know, basically, they're going to watch television, and they watch the least offensive program. But they don't have any real enthusiasm for it. I mean, if they went to bed early, they wouldn't really miss it. And, and that's what's relevant, in my judgment, is, is not just the number of votes, but how much work are people willing to do? Uh, are they willing to go door to door? Are they, are they willing to come to campaign headquarters and work? Are they willing to get out and go to vote? And you know, when you, when you turn 18, you get one vote, but you've also got another vote. And that's the, the power to take somebody to the polls. 
and then go drive back and get somebody else and take them to the polls. Uh, and that's what, you know, that's what elections turn on, is that kind of enthusiasm. That's one thing to measure. Another thing to measure is where it is, you know, there, there is an organization, there is a, a, a kind of a structure of the Democratic Party in the state of Iowa when you touch base with those people. How do they feel? Are they excited by the idea of my running? Or are they, you know, negative to it or neutral to it? There are people who contribute money to campaigns inside the state, outside of the state. How do they feel about it? And I would say, in general, that there has been enthusiasm on the part of all these people. Um, some more than others, but there's been you know, very little negative response. But that's what I mean when I say that, it, that I'm looking for the extent of genuine enthusiasm within the state. I hope I have explained by what I've said this evening that you know, being in the Senate of the United States is not the largest prize in the world in, in my eyes. And I'm not interested in, in coming out here if the people of Iowa don't, you know, don't want me to be their senator. And just getting a better advertising agency than, than Jack Miller so that I can go live in Washington, D.C. and make him come back to Sioux City. I mean, you know, there's not much point in that. Um, so that's what I'm looking for. And that's, you know, part of why I'm talking to you all this evening to get some feel. Of, I'm not going to every college campus and in the state. I'm not going into every old folks home, every high school until at this point. I'm just I'm trying to sample enough opinion. To, I'm doing my own polling. That's basically what I'm doing. And talking to other people who are doing the same thing on my behalf and uh, try to get a sense of it. Yes? Your position, though, would have been, you obviously know the movie and people are, but there'd be a tendency for you to go out there and get all the best ones that you can find. What, the best media people? Yeah. Part, that is a possibility. I mean, one of the options that is open to me is to turn to that kind of resource. You know, go to the, the, the entertainment people I know in Hollywood, in New York. Get, you know, whatever rock groups or whatever you all want will bring them into state. It'd be a lot of fun, you know. And, <laughs> and get, good, uh, get good media people, advertising agencies, PR firms, professional politicians. Uh, politics is going to be kind of boring in America this year. And the people who, who put money into politics instead of horse races think it would be exciting if I were to run in Iowa. Give them something to watch. You know, they say, hey, you see that piece about our candidate in Newsweek last week? You know, they like that kind of stuff. Uh, and so that's, uh, but that's, I don't know that I want to do that. I mean, that's, that's kind of inconsistent with the sort of principles that I believe in. That's the thing that bothers me, you see. You get put in this bind. Uh, it was part of what was wrong with Fred Harris's campaign. How can you run on a populist platform and arrive in town in a Learjet? <laughs> I mean, just something a little out of sync. That's, well, that's part of what it's all about. Yeah. Yes. If I decide not to run, I beg your pardon? Well, I think it is, if we're all in this thing together. Uh, no, I've got uh, another 16 months on my term at the FCC. And if the Iowa broadcasters would rather I be at the FCC, I'll uh, be there. <laughs> and, uh, and then after that, we'll uh, you know, figure out what we do from there. A lot, I mean, the options are kind of uh, obvious. If you're interested in pursuing it, I'll tell you. I mean, the kinds of things I could go to from there in terms of of university presidencies or teaching or foundations or public interest groups or law firms or whatnot. Uh, the kind of writing and speaking and so forth that I do. And uh, as I say, I don't think a position in the United States Senate is essential to that. I can go on doing that after I leave the FCC without being in the Senate. In some ways I can do it better. I predict. <laughs> Nicholas Johnson will not be renominated to the FCC by anyone who is likely to be elected president of the United States of America. And furthermore, in fairness to the candidates who have not been asked to commit themselves on this issue one way or another, <laughs> I think, uh, although I think it would be a rather telling question to put to a presidential candidate, uh, no, I really think, uh, you know, seven years is about enough. Uh, I, I have always, you know, kind of intended from the beginning to fill out my term there, a seven-year term which is another factor I've got to weigh in my mind in deciding not to fill out my seven-year term uh, and to run. 
Uh, most guys come into the FCC and serve a couple years and leave. Well, okay, I've done more than that. Uh, I don't think anybody can charge me with, you know, desertion uh, for running off. And uh, uh, I don't know, at least I'd be entitled to amnesty, I think, if, uh, for him. Uh, but um, that's, a, that's another part of it that I've got to wrestle out. Yeah. I'm one of the same president. You uh, were Senator from Iowa, but you want to pass my input to the people of Iowa. If that's true, how do you, what method do you, you employ to get that input? Well, we addressed that question a bit earlier. I'd be interested in, in your reaction to it. Uh, also, there are the standard devices, as I mentioned, uh, are newsletters that you send out with questionnaires asking people's opinions. Uh, you can hold meetings and just talk to people in the, in the streets or halls and take questions like we're doing now, which reflects some interest on your part. Uh, you can do uh, more scientifically designed polling. Uh, I thought about, you know, you might, have a, you might have a cabinet. I think a senator should have a cabinet. And you have advisors and councils and all this stuff and, and people preparing position papers and, and seeking out public opinion and stuff like that. That'd be kind of neat. There again, that's, that's, that's very tough. There, I mean, I could come back with some very quick and obvious things you could do. I mean, in your newsletter, what most congressmen and senators do who use this technique is to provide some information there in kind of the way that the League of Women Voters does sometimes with bulletins, where they give you some information about the issue and ask you your, your opinion on it. That's one way to do it. But basically, you know, we keep coming back to that tube. Uh, I mean, you're, you're really dependent upon what the mass media are willing to let the people of Iowa know and what they insist on keeping them ignorant about. And there just isn't much of any way you can beat that. This whole thing has gotten me more and more interested in the book business recently. Uh, not just because of, of my own, but because I've come to realize that with, with, I will say, Walter Cronkite and other guys in the business who acknowledge that they can't provide anything other than a headline service, that if you're really going to be informed, you can be informed. I mean, if you will, you know, invest in, say, 10 paperbacks a month. Uh, you, can, you can keep yourself fairly up on what's going on, because a lot of it's in books. Books are still pretty free. The conglomerates are buying up the books, the publishers. And they're going to be a crackdown on content. It's already beginning. But they're still pretty free. It's kind of like the record business still. Uh, you can still get a lot of ideas out in music. Uh, but I think that, you know, we've just got to encourage people to read more books. I just don't see, because without information, you just, you know, you just can't do it. Uh, but then you get back to that, that fundamentals of education and communication. At least in Iowa, you're starting with the, the highest or second highest literacy rate in the United States. So you've got a base to, to build on. Uh, but it, you're, you're right, it's a very real problem. Yes? Well, with regard to what? Do you want to make a... The fact that, that now it is having time Well, that's right. And, and your question? Well, you know, the, the best thing you can do is to use the First Amendment rights you've got, keep pushing these, these doctrines out. I mean, the, the First Amendment guarantees the right to, to say things that people don't like. I mean, things that people like, uh, you know, you don't need a First Amendment right to pay somebody a compliment. You don't need a First Amendment right to say that the, uh, the electric utilities and, and gas companies and I were doing a great job on behalf of the people. Uh, you can say that. Uh, the things you need the First Amendment rights for are the ideas that, uh, that the people in power don't want you to express. And so you got to test the, you know, test the limits of that, keep the thing alive. And lawyers need to get interested in this more than they are. Uh, we've done some of this uh, out of my office in the FCC with the doctrine of access. Uh, 
which, which we're evolving now, where we, the Supreme Court of the United States went with us in the Red Lion case and said that a broadcaster cannot censor, that, that uh, not only is the Fairness Doctrine constitutional, it may be constitutionally required because, in the, in the words of the court, there is, there is no right of private censorship in a medium that's not open to all. Now, we're now kind of fleshing out that doctrine, uh, but there, there's a lot more that needs to be done there. Yeah, I'll, listen, I'm going to take a couple more questions, and, or one more question, and then I think we'd better break because, uh, I mean, I've, I've really gone well beyond the kind of time you're supposed to use for one of these sessions, I understand. And uh, besides, we need, to, we need to drive on to another town yet tonight in the great old American tradition. Yes? Well, I, this is not so much a question, but you said you wanted some feedback on the uh, things you were talking about uh, being in touch with the electorate uh, through the media, through television, and through newsletters. Uh, speaking as one voter, I'm getting a little tired of being part of the process, of being processed myself. Uh, I would like to see a candidate who, if he can't get back himself and speak face to face, uh, will have people who can. Uh, I would like some more face to face talk. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on over the television. I'm not sure what's going on with the processes uh, of the printed media. But if I can see a man face to face in a meeting, I think we have an intelligent exchange. Okay, fair enough. what he does. He, you know, he campaigns uh, six years out of every six-year term. Who's going to pay those batteries of people? Are you willing to volunteer to be one of those people? Yes. Are you willing to engage in the face-to-face -face encounters and get a report back to me on what the people said who you talked to? Yes. Okay, sign up. <laughs> I'm for that. Okay.